Friday morning. It is August 13th. Welcome into the Morning Medical Update. Today we are talking about the latest recommendation, recommendations that all pregnant people vaccinated against COVID-19 make sure that they get their shot. We're going to break down some of those misconceptions surrounding the vaccine and pregnancy. But first, Doc Hawk joins us with our numbers. Good morning to you. Hi. Hi. Yeah, numbers are, are holding steady. Um, we are down into the lower to mid 40s. You know, we had got up into uh, the, the low 50s at one point. Um, a couple weeks ago, we were in the mid 30s, but again, now mid 40s, we have 45 active infections in the hospital uh, with 17 ICU patients and 12 of those on the ventilator. Unfortunately, we do have a patient who is on ECMO as well. Six of those 45 patients are vaccinated, so um, about 13%, uh, which again, continues to, to be uh, consistent through uh, here, through the city, and through the nation where we're seeing the majority of people who are coming to the hospital are unvaccinated. Um, Hayes has nine active patients and one in that recovery period as well. And we also have a, a little graph that was provided to us today by Amanda Cackler, just showing the age distribution of those patients in the hospital. A fairly uh, simple graph where at the bottom line, you see the age ranges um, with the decades 20 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49 and so on. And then the blue bars just showing how many of those patients are in that age distribution there. So obviously none in the very young category and the majority um, in that 50 to 59 category as well. All right, hang tight. We're gonna have some questions for you coming up yeah. here in just a moment, but always great to have our guest today, Dr. Kevin Alt, OBGYN and member of the Federal Advisory Panel for COVID-19 Vaccine Distribution. And before we get to our reporter questions, Dr. Alt, you're, the ASIP committee is meeting today at 10 a.m. Tell us what will be discussed, what's on the table? Well, we're gonna talk about booster dosers. The FDA late last night, uh, very late last night, made her, you know, approved a booster dose for certain immune compromised populations. And we're gonna talk that out today and, and hopefully make a clinical recommendation sometime. It's a three hour meeting. You're welcome to join us via live stream that's on the CDC's website. So uh, you can hear us discuss this live. Good to know. Reporters on the, question, on the line today? Okay, I do have one from KCUR. Alex is asking about the Delta Plus variant. Dr. Hawkinson appears to be picking up uh, here in the U.S. How does it vary from the regular Delta variant? Uh, does it increase risk for vaccinated or unvaccinated people? Yeah, you know, right now we don't have any uh, evidence or data to suggest that it's any different in uh, the scope of uh, the severity of disease it causes or vaccinated versus unvaccinated. Um, Right now, we just don't have a lot of that information. Again, right now, nothing is really out-competing the Delta variant um, in any given particular community. We obviously saw that Delta was able to come in and out-compete uh, the Alpha variant. So I think, uh, again, the main thing moving forward, the main uh, point to understand is we are going to continue to see variants arise. Now, how will that really impact vaccination and vaccination immunity? Right now, again, all of the vaccinations we have look to provide continued good immunity toward that whole spectrum of COVID-19, but especially uh, for hospitalization, severe disease and death, the vaccines continue to lower your risk. So I don't anticipate that there's gonna be any change with uh, the uh, Delta Plus. Uh, that is just one more change or mutation that they have identified. They call it the plus and would certainly defer to, to Dr. All with any of the other comments or thoughts. But right now there's no really difference that we've been able to see or signal uh, in the data to suggest difference in disease or difference in vaccine efficacy. What can you add? Well, we, we've looked at this data. We actually looked at this data at the last meeting when we talked about booster doses too. In the test tube, you see that antibodies from vaccinated people still neutralize these variants. And so that's the good news. And then since I've been on the show last in the New England Journal of Medicine, you probably talked about this since it was last week, uh, you know, there was an article that says there was still disease protection for the RNA vaccines. And so I think most of the news is still good. Of course, yeah. you, you know, you and I cannot predict the future. So we're always worried about the, the the worst variants, but for right now, the news is good. All right, other questions on the line, reporters? 
Okay, so it's follow up Friday. We're going to get to questions from the week, but of course, send in some of those now. We're going to try to slip a few of those in before we get out today. So, um, Dr. Alt, though, a lot of questions have been coming in for you, no surprise this week. Um, recently, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the Society for Fetal Medi uh, uh, Maternal Fetal Medicine recommended that all pregnant people be vaccinated against COVID 19. So, what caused this recommendation to come out now versus maybe six months ago? Well, I think we were solidifying our recommendation based on n new data. So, um, you know, when we six months ago or eight months ago, when the vaccines were brand new, we were in a little bit of a uh, dilemma because we were going to vaccinate healthcare workers first. This this all seems like ancient history, even though it was just a few months ago. And there are hundreds and thousands of pregnant and lactating healthcare workers. And so, you know, we made a recommendation without a lot of data, other than we knew it was bad to have COVID and when you were pregnant. Now we have data that's even more sobering about the severity of COVID during pregnancy. We also have some data about how the pregnancy is affected by COVID as far as preeclampsia and preterm birth, so two of the more common complications of pregnancy. There's also data about p passage of antibodies to newborns. There's also data that says it works in pregnant women, so, that, so there's just a lot more data. I think the 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 ACOG, the American College of OBGYN, went first, then CDC followed up with a recommendation shortly after that. There's actually some a publication from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that I just mentioned that shows a similar miscarriage rate in people that uh, get vaccinated compared to other groups. And so that was kind of what made it click over for the CDC. It's, it's a compilation of, you know, six or eight months of good, solid data on the topic. So a misconception that's common right now is that the vaccine will affect the baby's DNA. Is this true? The vaccine will not affect the baby's DNA. Uh, there are two vaccines, of course. So one is an RNA vaccine. Uh, fetuses, uh, babies have plenty of enzymes to break down RNA and lipase, and that's about the only uh, thing that's in that vaccine. I'm not sure that the Janssen vaccine, the vector adenovirus vaccine, could get to the uterus either. Uh, it's a non-replicating uh, virus and so uh, viral vector. And so I'm not sure that those things are going to happen. Those things don't happen if you're not pregnant. So I don't know why they're going to happen when you are pregnant. Okay. So. I, ha I had to ask. Okay. But what advice do you have for a woman who maybe recently had a baby Perhaps she's breastfeeding and she's not vaccinated. What should she do? Have great data about that too. So there was a study that was in one of the journal, the American Medical Association journals, that shows that the, the components of the RNA vaccine don't actually get into the breast milk. And that kind of goes along with what I said previously. There are plenty of enzymes, lipases and RNA aces that we all learned about in undergrad or medical school that break down those. Uh, break down those components of the vaccine. So they don't get to the breast milk. So I, I'm not that worried about breastfeeding women. Uh, I'm worried about the effects of COVID on their health, of course, but I'm not worried about the effects of the vaccine on the newborn. Okay, has this changed? If you get the vaccine while pregnant, your baby has some protection when it's born against COVID-19? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And that's one of the reasons we recommend some other vaccines routinely during pregnancy. We recognize, we we recommend uh, influenza vaccine to protect newborns the first few months. That that vaccine also protects mothers in pregnancies. And we also recommend pertussis or whooping cough boosters during late pregnancy to protect babies from, from whooping cough when they're in the first few months of life. Okay, before this question comes in, we get it sometimes. Let's clear it up. Can the COVID-19 vaccine cause infertility? I think I've gotten that every time I've been on. I think this is my fifth or sixth time. The short answer is no. The longer answer is that no vaccines really cause that problem. And in, in my lifetime, that's been used against four uh, vaccines over two decades. And so every time there's a new vaccine, unfortunately, that rumor uh, gets started. And frankly, it's misinformation. No vaccine is associated with uh, with infertility, not this one, not any of them. So if you look on social media or you hear other people talk, you'll uh, see that about three dozen of people got pregnant during the trials last year, even though they were using birth control. And so some people have suggested it's a fertility booster. It's probably not that either, So, but it <laughs> probably doesn't make a difference either way. So, Well, a lot of stuff swirling out on social media, so we always have to clear right. this up week after week, so that's no, all right. No, well, I, I, I've heard all this before. You've so, heard it but, all. But, I, you know, there's a 
reporter called Tara Hall, who writes a lot, of, who's based in Dallas, who writes a lot about vaccines. And b back in the mid 90s, we were trying to vaccinate uh, pregnant women in Africa to prevent newborn tetanus. And the rumor was there, and they, they weren't going to be able to have any more children. And so, you know, it's just been recycled over and over again over about a 25 year period, unfortunately. I know, so. you love it when mis misinformation gets out on Facebook and TikTok and all that good it, stuff. It just, re it's the same stuff. It's just plug in a different it, vaccine. It's just, yeah, I mean, again, some of it is just um, lack of knowledge, lack of knowing what you don't know. Um, but some of it is very um, calculated and, and directed misinformation uh, to help that cause of, of whatever that cause may be, whether it's just creating division, um, lack of trust in authority or medical or science figures. Um, so, but I think we have to take those questions head on and just continue to answer them because they're going to continue to be out there. And there's science here too. Not, we're not just uh, using our authority over this. So there's uh, a nice uh, study in women who are undergoing IVF in vitro fertilization. They look at pregnancy rates in vaccinated and unvaccinated women. They were the same. So there's a nice study from Northwestern in Chicago that looked at the placenta in women who had been vaccinated, so directly looking for placental damage, they actually found that the placenta was protected by vaccination. The receptor for the Delta virus is actually quite abundant in the placenta, and so we're beginning to see some evidence accumulate that there's preeclampsia and other problems to the blood supply and the placenta to the fetus. So, so yeah, the more data that comes out, the better idea this seems like it sure. is. So. And we're sure glad that people keep asking the same questions, because that means that we get a chance to set folks straight and, and give them more information. So uh, no wrong question, that's for sure. Okay, so we want to get to our community questions. Many of these we didn't get to throughout the week. Um, so we're going to tackle some of those before we get to some new ones today. Okay, Dr. Alt. This first question for you. I'm hearing more and more about cases of pregnant women with COVID-19 being hospitalized and then needing to deliver the baby early. Can you explain why? Well, everybody that's been pregnant that's listening can tell you that pregnancy is a stress in the heart and lungs. And so if you add COVID into that mix, especially if you're in later pregnancy or you add influenza or other respiratory viruses, you can certainly decrease maternal oxygen supply, decrease maternal heart function, and end up in the spot where you're decreasing oxygen supply to the baby. And so you're right, obstetricians will intervene, of course, uh, in those situations where the baby's in trouble and viable. Uh, so yeah, that's that's gonna happen. And you know, that's a common cause, maternal complications are common cause for preterm birth. And this is just another uh, item that we've added onto the list. So yeah, we've seen this before with influenza and other respiratory viruses. What about nurses and other health professionals who speak out against the vaccine? Does this make people pause and consider not getting it? Well, healthcare professionals should have the tools to look at the evidence, uh, especially in an era where you can do it on your computer, your workstation, in your clinic, or in your office. So, uh, you know, we were all trained in evidence-based medicine. That's been a thing since I was in medical school, which was a little while ago. And so, you, you know, the, and so we can talk about the evidence and say, when we don't know, we don't know. And, and that was, you, you asked what was going on six months ago. There was a lot of things we didn't know about pregnancy and COVID. Now we know quite a bit more. So. So I'm concerned that uh, that evidence-based medicine is taking a beating in those situations. And so, and that's also an incredibly small minority of, of healthcare professionals as well. Well, Dr. Hawkinson, I mean, it's a good question though, because, you know, again, when we go back to social media or people Googling things or reading articles that may or may not be true, when you hear a nurse or yeah. someone with a medical degree, I'm just speaking as a layman myself, you think, okay, well, if they have questions, should I have questions? Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it is very difficult because we do look to our, our health care providers, our physicians, nurses. Um, but again, every individual is, is different. Um, certainly, there is that bell curve of the majority of health care providers who ascribe to the uh, most up-to-date, accurate information. Uh, there are still others that have questions as well. So I think it kind of boils down to that individual or that practice. Okay, also I have another question for you. With masks not required in many preschools, mm -hmm. should I send my son even if he'll likely be the only one in a mask? I'm also told not all teachers are vaccinated either. Yeah, um, Yeah. I mean, that is a difficult question and this goes back to how do you assess the individual risk for you and your family? Um, 
We know that, again, children can have the same amount of virus in their upper respiratory tract or sometimes even more than adults with the same amount of disease or even no symptoms. So we know that children can get the disease, they can spread it. Um, this goes back to do you feel that uh, if your child goes and gets it, you and your family would otherwise be safe? I think those are things you have to understand. There would also be, you know, um, the social concerns uh, of that as, as your child is the only one in the mask. And it's a hard decision to make, I do agree. Uh, but we also have said that it is important for kids to be out in those social settings, such as school, where they can be around others, where they can learn for their mental health, emotional health, physical activity, getting out and doing things. But it is certainly a difficult decision. But just understand that when you make that decision, you are making it with um, the greatest amount of, of accurate medical knowledge that you can. And then you can also then add in some of those other things that are important to you to help you judge that risk. Dr. Alt, what can you add to that? Well, we don't have a pediatrician on the show mm -hmm. today, but you can look at the American Academy of Pediatricians website, and they did a very thorough overview of this topic maybe three or four weeks ago, and I saw that they even tweeted about it yesterday. So, um, yeah, and then it was in the New York Times a few days ago. I don't know if you saw that from the uh, Duke, a P Duke pediatrician published their experience in North Carolina in the New York Times, not in a medical journal. But, you, you know, it looks like mass protect school children. I mean, that was kind of the conclusion yeah of all that, and of course this is being debated across the metro area, but yeah. um, you know, I, I think the information from the American Academy of Pediatrics was the most approachable and thorough that I've seen. Yeah, and I mean, again, keeping kids in school is of utmost importance, keeping those adults and teachers in, uh, well it is important as well. Um, you know, we just, there's an article up on CNN today, I think in the first day of school at a school in Reno, Nevada, 80 kids were exposed, so now they are out for two weeks, so they are gonna be further isolated at home doing virtual learning, which virtual learning is pretty tough if you've had to do anything more than an hour of watching yeah. a lecture or anything like that. So um, just as you said, we know the things that protect uh, adults and children in those schools. Um, if they can continue to do that as much as possible, uh, hopefully they can keep in school and not be in quarantine for two weeks. And kids are pretty compliant. If you if you yeah. offer up a mask, a lot of them will just yeah. wear it if you ask them to. And, and it's become the norm. Over exactly. The past year, so. All right, uh, Dr. Hawkinson, is ivermectin a viable alternative to the vaccine? Yeah. Short answer: No. Ivermectin is not recommended by the uh, Infectious Disease Society of America, which is a a, a group of infectious disease physicians and practitioners. Um, it is not recommended by the World Health Organization, and, and unfortunately, the NIH says there's not enough data to recommend for or against that. But all of the best quality evidence uh, would say that ivermectin poses no benefit for either prophylaxis against getting the infection and having symptoms, recovery, or for treatment of uh, COVID-19. So ivermectin should not be used. I would not, I would uh, consider changing or talk who you're talking to, who if they are prescribing it, um, but uh, vaccination is the best preventive measure along with those other non-pharmaceutical interventions. Dr. Alt, what is the alternative to the vaccine? Well, vaccine is part of a approach that we've hit on here a little bit as far as social distancing, mask, uh, you know, outdoor activities rather than indoor activities. So I, I don't know if that's an alternative. Um, the thing I usually use when I'm giving a lecture to medical students is the Swiss cheese model. You know, we have these uh, interventions. Some of them are shared responsibilities, such as wearing masks in rooms, and some of them are individual responsibilities, such as getting vaccinated. And, and I would like to state that um, I believe ivermectin in the NIH guidelines, uh, you know, would say it should not be used unless there is a trial. We do have currently have trials going on. So if some of those uh, well done randomized controlled trials do come back and show benefit, we'll certainly update the public. But as of right now, that is the recommendations of those three major bodies. Dr. Alt, are pregnant women considered immunocompromised? Are they less protected by the vaccine? Well, there's certainly alterations in the immune system, but based on the first publication, which was from Israel, <clears throat> it looks like they're as protected as other groups that we've vaccinated. It came in right at 80%. And so that, that's somewhat similar to what we've seen before. And it's more recent, so that probably reflects the Delta activity against the Delta variant as well. So, so yes, yeah, so it looks like the vaccine works in pregnant women. And, and there'll be, a, you know, by this time next year, there'll be two dozen publications to answer that question. But the first one looks really good. 
I have Hashimoto's disease and had an adverse reaction to my first Moderna shot. That was five months ago, but now with the rise in Delta, I mm -hmm. want to go ahead and get my second shot. Mm -hmm. Will it still be effective? Yeah, um, I'll certainly start and uh, would also defer to Dr. Alt to correct me. Um, yeah, you should still get your second. I believe there was a recent MMWR that looked, or maybe it was a New England Journal article, that looked at reactions and, and people who got first doses and had reactions, even severe significant reactions, and getting the second dose. And after the second dose, most of them did even better than the first and didn't have those reactions. So um, I believe that's the stance. I, I think it's the MMWR yeah. because those are recommendations from the group that we work with for ACIP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. We come out with clinical consent. We don't, but the people at the CDC come out with clinical considerations a day or two after our meeting. And I think that was in the last uh, go round of recommendations. You'll have to really dig into the fine print. Your doctor will have to really mm -hmm. dig into the fine print, but the information's there. Okay, social question. My dad wants me to attend his wedding where no one will be masking. I have two unvaccinated kids under the age of 12 who have been very diligent during this pandemic. What are the chances of spreading COVID to them if I were to come in contact? Well, if you were to come into contact, um, if you had an exposure and you got the disease, certainly you would have a fairly good chance of uh, spreading it to those household contacts, especially you know now with Delta, where we see maybe those household transmission rates um, or attack rates are maybe slightly higher than they were with some of the other variants. So there's a, a, a good chance if you are having a, a large group gathering, and we have seen this um, played out, and it started with that Massachusetts MMWR report from the CDC, um, that this virus can spread easily even to vaccinated people who may or may not have symptoms but can still spread the disease as well. So I think that large group gathering does put you in a risky situation. If you do have to go to it, try to do those non-pharmaceutical interventions that you can, distance as much as possible, mask uh, if you can, and um, try to be somewhere where there's good ventilation. Hopefully it would be either outside or maybe under a tent or something where you have a little bit better ventilation. But those are the things that I would recommend. We've still got a few more months of outdoor wedding yeah. uh, weather. Hopefully it, it will be soon if you're planning on going. So, Well, what can you tell us about the data the CDC used to issue its new guidelines on vaccine safety for pregnant women, Dr. Ald? Well, I, I alluded to it a little bit, so I can go into some more detail. So there are actually two publications. One is not quite published yet, but the older publication was in the New England Journal of Medicine. So if you've had the vaccine, you've uh, noticed that you get asked to participate in VSAFE. And so, I, and it, I just got an alert the other day because it had been my six month anniversary of my second uh, dose. And so mm -hmm. uh, in there, it's gonna ask you if you're pregnant or not. And if you check that off as tens of thousands of people have, then you uh, get asked more questions about your pregnancy if you volunteer to be part of that cohort. And fortunately, as I said, tens of thousands of people have, vaccine, have volunteered. And so what's in the New England Journal of Medicine looks at risk of the vaccine, and so, and there aren't any risks. There's no increased stillbirth rate, there's no increased miscarriage rate, there's no congenital anomalies associated with the vaccine. There was a paucity of people who got the vaccine early in pregnancy, and so this second publication that's not quite out yet, but is alluded to in the press uh, release from the CDC shows a miscarriage rate of about 14%. We usually say it's somewhere between 10 and 25, so it's right in the middle, and it's similar to what it was in the previous publication and, and no congenital anomalies. So it, so the news is reassuring. So that I think that was the data that made, uh, made it drop over for the CDC. For the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, uh, there's more of a local connection. Uh, we are divided up into different districts and our former district chair, Dr. Tucker, who's actually in a maybe be here in a few weeks to give a talk uh, is our current president. He's based in Mississippi. He's a high-risk obstetrician. He was getting overwhelmed in his practice with ill pregnant women as lots of high-risk obstetricians are. And so, you know, it was a little more pragmatic from the viewpoint of the American College of OBGYN. You know, we were seeing, well, and, and the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, we were seeing the endpoints. What do you think will come first, EUA for those under 12 or full approval for those 12 and older? And will it, uh, one affect the other? Um, so the, I think the difference for the, the, I may be wrong about this in the long term, first of all, and, and I, we will know by the end of September, mm -hmm. but 
it, my opinion, for better or for worse, is that uh, I'm guessing the BLA, the full approval, will happen sometime at the end of September, and then the under 12 will probably happen sometime before then, but I'm guessing, basically. So, hmm. uh, and I may get different information later today that makes me wrong. So, uh, but you, the thing to keep up on, not just in the news, but if you really want to get into the gritty details, is just go to the ACIP website every week or two and we update you know the next visit or the next meetings that we're having we usually only have six days of meetings a year and we're having emergency meetings about every two weeks now so we're we're way we've had more meetings in the past six months than we've had in the prior five years so so we're meeting pretty frequently and these are the next two topics that are coming up on the horizon if the vaccine helps keep people out of the hospital and off a ventilator does it also protect from long hauler symptoms well, I'll start and you know, I, I don't think we know that we hope and speculate it probably will because it overall reduces that spectrum of disease. Um, that question is being asked and looked at, uh, but I don't think we really have a lot of good data right now to really uh, understand that. So hopefully within you know the next few uh, weeks or a few months, we'll have some more publications again, just because the nature of long haul syndrome where you really are trying to identify those symptoms that persist after um, say uh, three months or 12 weeks uh, after that acute illness. Uh, but it is being looked at and I think we all speculate and hope that it will, but we certainly need to see some of the data. Okay, so we've got some great questions coming in this morning. So I want to ask um, our docs about that. Sally had a question on something you just mentioned though. It was uh, with the Delta variant and school starting, any word about them trying to speed up the process to get all kids under 12? So again, the American Academy of Pediatricians has taken a lead on this topic and uh, had a series of press releases and other things last week. And I think uh, turning up the pressure in anticipation of the, of the Delta variant and school opening, uh, uh, you know, opened some doors for us at the FDA. At least that's my interpretation from the outside uh, looking in. So yeah, so it looks like, uh, the, you know, the FDA has changed tactics a little bit and devoted some more resources to reviewing those data. Okay, Sarah asking, which comorbidities do you anticipate the third dose of vaccine will be available for? Do you want to answer that or you want me to answer that? I'll let you. Okay, I'll probably forget one, so good. You can go second. So yeah. uh, HIV disease, uh, transplants, uh, cancer treatment. I think I'm missing one. I think there are four groups, so. Is it? certain immunosuppressive drugs it might be that so but it's about one to three yeah. percent of the american population depending on how you cut it of course our decisions are data driven so there are going to be some groups we don't have data for like hashimoto's disease since that came up earlier so uh you know so we, so we're going to base our decisions on data and if we don't have data we will you'll hear us discuss you know um, our, among the 14 or 15 of us what we're going to do when we don't have data Clear this up for Damien. 4.6 billion doses given worldwide. Why is it not working? I I would argue that it is working. So uh, you know, I, I one of the Twitter accounts that I follow are some uh, some of the hospital uh, personnel and the fire chief in Springfield, Missouri. I mean, I think they would like everybody to be vaccinated in Springfield, Missouri, a few months ago because 90 to 95 percent of their uh, current admissions uh, and getting overwhelmed. They've had a thousand people hospitalized at Cox Health in Springfield over, since June. So, and almost all of them are unvaccinated. So, I, I mean, as far as keeping people out of the hospital, you know, that has been very successful as far as that goes. So, and, uh, and I, you know, we have an infectious disease expert here, so I'll defer to Dr. Hawkinson, but you know, the story is kind of becoming similar to the flu. You may still get the flu if you get the flu vaccine, but you're not gonna end up on ECMO or have a Dr. Hawkinson take care of you for any of those kind of problems in our ICU. Yeah, I, I guess I would start by saying, what do you mean it's not working? Do you mean that why is there still surges? Well, I think there's still surges because as we've seen around the nation, the vast majority um, are those people that are unvaccinated. The vast majority that have to go on to the ICU and die are those that are unvaccinated. So I would suggest that vaccination is working. And, and I heard this uh, quote and somebody talking about this a couple of weeks ago on a podcast. We would love if 100% of the people who came to the hospital were vaccinated because you know what that means? Overall, our 
full numbers, our true numbers of hospitalized patients would be greatly reduced from what it is now because um, 85, 90% or more of the people that come to the hospital are unvaccinated. So I think I would just start with what do you mean by the vaccines not working? The vaccine is working for those that are vaccinated and those community, uh, uh, that community where those are highly vaccinated. But unfortunately, we still have a, a large number of people who are not getting the vaccine, who are not previously vaccinating. And that is where we are seeing those uh, surges in those communities uh, all across the United States right now. Thank you for that. Dr. Alt. We talked about the immunocompromised group before, and Dr. Talbot from Vanderbilt made a really good point. She's one of the members of the committee uh, with me, and she, she said, you know, if you have a loved one who's in one of that one to three percent of people that's had a transplant or something like that, you really want to get vaccinated to protect them. So, you know, you know if you are going to socialize with them, if you're, if you're going to see them on Labor Day, you know, you're going to help take care of them if they're having cancer chemotherapy, you know, you want to get vaccinated for them. And the same is if, you know, some of those people attend your church or your synagogue, you know, that's a reason for you to get vaccinated because of those people. And the reason I thought about that, you know, is we're talking about third dose of uh, vaccine for a certain set of the population. And as Dr. Hawkinson just said, we really need a lot more people to get one and two doses as well. And that'll help protect that, com that uh, vulnerable group. And on that note, Janet wants to know, are the boosters a different formula or just another dose of the regular regular Moderna? I'm pretty sure they're going to be another dose of the Pfizer or okay. Moderna. But again, that data came out late, so late last night. I knew I was going to hear it this morning. I just had coffee instead of looked at it this morning because I knew I was going to hear about it at 10. So. Okay, so Anil, good morning to you. Um, would I be considered as immunocompromised with severe COVID and now some sort of lung damage, asthma? He has got all sorts of stuff going on, he says, as far as needing a booster, or should the vaccine boosting off of my residual immunity be strong enough for someone who's immunocompromised? So that was in the MMWR last week, and I'm not sure I'm gonna remember enough details, but basically there was a study where they had people who uh, had COVID and recovered and followed them and had COVID and recovered and got vaccinated. And the people who got vaccinated reduced their risk of getting COVID again mm -hmm. c considerably. Yeah. And I'm sure there must be some people with asthma and that kind of thing, but I can't remember the tables. Yeah, and, and I believe so. for um, the immunosuppression, just as Dr. Alt had talked about, um, those were, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, blood cancers or cancers or solid organ transplant, they also have some reduction uh, or no cellular uh, or humoral immunity. I don't think just the structural lung damage that was caused uh, by the infection and, and everything that you went through would, not, would necessarily qualify you as immunosuppressed. So we're really looking at your immune system functioning. Okay. All right, can you talk, Rebecca wants to know if you could talk about the study um, release say that Pfizer is only 40%-ish effective against Delta, but Moderna is higher. Is Moderna superior to Pfizer? Why don't I take a crack at it and then yeah. I'll, I'll defer to you. So um, the efficacy studies are gonna get more and more confusing, I think, as we go on. So, uh, because we're gonna use different endpoints. Uh, you know, if you look at hospitalization, all the vaccines are doing very well as far as keeping people out of our 40 or 50 beds here that we have devoted to COVID. So if you start looking at, uh, you know, weekly cultures or weekly PCR tests, which is one of the studies that the CDC is doing, you, you know, you might find s some, cases of, of breakthrough infection that are asymptomatic and it's going to look lower plus you have a group of people that you know tens of millions of Americans who have had COVID and recovered especially recently and so uh, you know and they ha may have some partial immunity so the unvaccinated group that you're comparing it to may have some partial immunity so it's it's going to get very muddled and I, I don't think that study was published uh, I think that might be the Israeli data that, that, that the health ministry, uh, you know, pronounces. So, and, and Israel's done an excellent job in keeping people out of the hospital. There are yeah. less people in the hospital in the whole nation of Israel than there are in Springfield, not picking on our friends in Springfield. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it exactly goes to your point of what is your endpoint? What are you looking at? What do you mean by uh, efficacy? Is it if you detect it on PCR from a nasal pharyngeal swab? Is it if you have symptoms? Um, all of these 
all of the best data right now, especially surrounding uh, Delta variant, continue to show that those who are vaccinated have a much less risk of going to the hospital, having severe disease and death. So the efficacy for these vaccines against Delta variant continues to be very high when you are looking at those endpoints of hospitalization, severe disease and death. Um, so the efficacy of 40%, I think was really mostly directed toward symptomatic disease. It might have even been just swabbing a nose and seeing the PCR. Okay, educate us non-medical people. What is ECMO? Mm. ECMO is basically um, hemodialysis. So if you have kidney failure, you undergo kidney hemodialysis. It's basically that for your lungs. So you are using uh, an external uh, device to help with the gas exchange to give your lungs a rest or because your lungs aren't able to exchange. And that is really the absolute uh, last, essentially, uh, last life-saving measure that we can take to try and keep you uh, alive and get you revived back to, to health. Donna wants to know, for districts that are not requiring masks and making them optional, do you have published documentation that we could share with the superintendent and the Board of Education? Where can she send them to? Uh, I, I, some of my best friends are pediatricians. I keep bringing up the American Academy of yeah. Pediatricians. So, uh, so I would send them to that website, especially since it's so detailed, you know, any, any nuanced message you can get off of that. And so, and, and you know, just in the New York Times a few days ago, re real life five data from a universal masking protocol of the state of North Carolina made masks look really, really good. So, I mean, my concern is, and again, we can't predict the future, but my concern is similar to what Dr. Hawkinson said, you know, we're gonna be a week or two into school and we're gonna have half the school or two thirds of the students and staff out. And uh, one of the members of the ACIP is actually the health secretary for Arkansas. And they had some schools that opened, you know, just a week or two ago, they're already closing from uh, from COVID spread. And, and they have a law against mask mandates, as you may have heard in the local news recently. Yeah, I mean, I, I would certainly, yeah, I would go to the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, also use the CDC. All of those websites where they do talk about that, they do have re references provided. Um, also check the MMWR. I think there was a study that was published in uh, maybe May of this year that looked at reduction in schools and incidence rate of COVID-19. And what they showed that with masking and good ventilation, you had a reduction of almost 40% of the incidence of COVID uh, in those schools and in those settings. So they are out there, get to those sources, and those sources will have good references that you can actually pull out uh, the specific articles as well. Rebecca wants to know, what do people do if they need urgent care locally with hospitals filling up? Yeah, it, it's dangerous. It, it certainly is dangerous. Um, for instance, um, urgent care for a heart attack. We heard some stories that uh, I believe, uh, I don't remember if it was here in Kansas or if it was in Missouri, somebody who was having a heart attack, uh, EMS or the ambulance had to go to six different hospitals because it was so packed and they couldn't even treat those quote unquote normal conditions. So it is a, it is a significant concern uh, and it's one that we try to deal with every day and address to make sure we have that ability to treat those very life-threatening, um, not routine, but pre-pandemic illnesses in states as well. Few more questions. Um, good morning, Isaac. Uh, he asked if vaccinated people can still get infected, can they still create new variants or is it less likely because their bodies clear the virus faster? Yeah, I would say during the replication process of the virus, you always have that chance to uh, produce new variants. Again, remember these variants uh, that we have detected, it's not just one mutation or one change in amino acid, but it is several. So you certainly still have that risk, but the risk is greatly reduced because as you have that specific immune system and those T cells and those antibodies, they are helping reduce overall further replication and get those viruses removed from your body. Nikki says, what do you say to people who have been more focused on their rights to not get vaccinated rather than the data? What are those people hearing that might change their mind and how could we change their mind? Um, the, the thing that I have read several times through this, not that this is a scientific publication, but there's a uh, Supreme Court case called Jacobson versus Massachusetts that was cited yesterday by our current Supreme Court justices uh, about uh, mandates during um, 
during uh, uh, the pandemic. It happened to be smallpox then, and it happens to be COVID now. But there's a very eloquent passage from one of the Supreme Court justices of that era that I would refer you to. And it talks about that tension between, you know, rights and disease. And so uh, the Supreme Court, you know, for 107 years has upheld uh, that uh, during a pandemic, we have to take some of these measures. And so uh, that's part of our law, a law that was upheld yesterday, I think, or the day before with the Indiana University case. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think that's where we are. What could you add to that, Dr. Hawkinson, just about people worried about their rights and not, you know, yeah. happy to get vaccinated? I mean, you know, people certainly do have the rights to make those uh, decisions. I think also some of that depends uh, what are you doing, what is your uh, daily duties. I think that um, I think it is okay for certain private businesses uh, to to mandate those types of things, you know, that is a larger discussion for the people that run those businesses, for the uh, elected leaders and things of that nature. It is certainly your right, but I would also encourage you to also do the right thing and think about your other citizens in your community as well. These vaccines are safe, they're very efficacious, they will help protect you and your family. Um, just continue to do your due diligence and looking for those appropriate resources to help answer those questions and, uh, you know, get vaccinated or change your mind to get vaccinated. Joanne wants to know if there are any vaccinated people in the ICU that are on vents. Um, we don't have that information right now. I think we presented a little bit of information earlier in the week, and we have historically these past few weeks been presenting that information. Uh, today there was an issue with our um, our our computer program that we use. I think this week we had another issue, but we will continue to provide that information. Uh, we are doing it at least once a week. I don't have that information with me right now. Okay, and just the last question is for those who are immunocompromised uh, and they may be eligible for this third shot, what is the next step for them? Do they contact their doctor? Most of those people, because of their health, are going to be plugged into healthcare. So I hope, uh, you know, we get into an equity issue if they're not. But you can talk to your transplant doctor, you can talk to your cancer doctor, you can talk to your HIV uh, physician if, uh, you know, that's where you get your care. But yeah, that information should be available on public websites and through uh, mass mail emailings to members of the groups that take care of those patients by Monday or Tuesday. The cancer center here is already contacted me, believe me. We'll, we'll get it out for our patients pretty darn quickly about that information. And so, uh, so yeah, I, I mean, there, the issue though, uh, as was I think implied, is that there may be some people we're gonna miss and that'll be too bad because we'll need to keep on top of that as we have through this whole process of vaccinating people. Yeah, and I was already talking to um, some of our vaccine people. We are already working on that process, but the best person to go through is that person that is managing your immunosuppression or your uh, significant medical um, comorbidities. A lot of great questions yeah. coming in today. I'm going to save these so that we can get to them um, throughout next week. So I promise we will get to those. But I want, do you want to get to our final thoughts here on this Friday, Dr. Alt? Let's start with you. Well, you know, I'm an obstetrician, and so I was thinking about what's the advantage, you know, that I, when I talk to my patients, what do I tell them about the COVID vaccine? You know, I tell them that it protects them, that it protects their health. You know, being in the hospital, being in the ICU is not good for your pregnancy or you, either one. And so we're also beginning to see some data that's kind of unique for this uh, disease that I mentioned previously, that there's actually placental damage that leads to obstetrical complications and, and newborn complications. And so you're protecting yourself, you're protecting your pregnancy, plus you get the bonus of, of passing antibodies to your newborn. And so there's uh, there's at least three reasons. I'm sure if I had longer, I could think of more, but that's probably a good summary. So Well, that's why we'll just have you back on. Yeah, thank you. So. It never ends. Dr. Hawkinson, final thoughts today. Yeah, uh, final thoughts is uh, in regards to that one question, the vaccines do work. Uh, the vaccines we have now work. They do help prevent the whole spectrum of COVID-19, including hospitalization, severe disease and death. We, set, we certainly have uh, diligent viewers who want to get out and, and get that 
third or that additional dosing, even if they aren't immune compromised. Uh, but right now, we will wait for the recommendations for those immune compromised populations about getting additional dosing. Until then, we still need so many people just to get a first dose. So encourage those people you know that are still hesitant uh, to go get uh, vaccination. That will help decrease the spread and overall help that individual and, and their loved ones as well. Through a bunch of questions at you both today. Thank you so much <laughs> for answering them. Appreciate it. Okay, so thank you all for being with us today. We appreciate you as always. We are back on Monday with how hospitals are handling the surge in COVID cases, the staffing issues popping up, and the concern if cases continue to climb. That's Monday starting at 8 o'clock. We will see you then. And we leave you today with Dr. Catherine O'Neill from LSU with a remarkable way of explaining the safety around the COVID vaccine. Everybody thinks it's not going to be me. I'm really healthy. It's just not going to be me. Unfortunately, the Delta variant has proved us wrong. This year's virus holds on more tightly, infects you more deeply, and is making young people sick. Today, 11 children are admitted to our children's hospital, children who were healthy before they came in the doors. We never saw that last year. Today, we have 10 20-year-olds admitted to the adult hospital, two of them on a breathing machine. We never saw that last year. That's you. Those are people who look and act just like you. And they were living their normal lives two weeks ago. This Delta variant is going to affect us all very differently. We all need protection for ourselves because more of our age group will become severely ill. And most importantly, because when you get vaccinated, you spread it less. And when you spread it less, you end the surge. Unvaccinated people are the reason for variants. Mutants occur because of uncontrolled spread. When you get vaccinated, not only are you healthier, but you decrease the spread. The only way to keep the next variant from coming out is vaccination, which decreases the spread of the virus. There are so many people have said that uh, this vaccine's too new, that uh, they don't wanna take it because it got developed so quickly. It's really interesting as a scientist to hear that because nothing that we do is quick. We all gave each other high fives, and couldn't believe the success of a person's lifetime of work with mRNA vaccines ready just in time for the pandemic. When I think about preparing all those years with mRNA vaccines, which are 15 to 20 years in the making, and a person's lifetime of research just in time for this, I think about our team. I think about elite athletes who work their whole lives to get to the national championship and play the best game of their lives. And for those of us who are the average sports fan, we actually think that it was just that season's practice that got them there. Absolutely not. It was the first person who put a ball in their hand when they were three years old. They have been practicing and working every single day, not just that season. And that's what this COVID-19 vaccine is. We have been working for decades to make sure that when we had a pandemic, we took it out of our back pocket and we said, we're ready. We should be proud of this. We were ready. We should be proud of our athletes. They're ready. We should be proud of you. You have been waiting your entire life to contribute to your community. And today's the day. Get your vaccine. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stein's podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.